Good afternoon, Stan. The Taliban names their new government with the Prime Minister Mullah Mohammed Hassan Akhand. What do you know about him? What can we expect from him and this new government? Yeah, this is the ghost of Mullah Omar, Dan. That's what we're seeing here. Um, you talk about, about the Prime Minister. He also was the Deputy Prime Minister back in the 1990s. He was a Chief Lieutenant of Mullah Omar, who was the founder and supreme leader of the Taliban. Abdul Ghani Baradar is the Deputy Prime Minister. He fought alongside Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar's own son, Mullah Yaqub, is the Defence Minister. So there is a real connection here to the Taliban of the 1990s. The talk that we are seeing, Taliban Mark II, a different Taliban, this is the same organisation committed to the same ideology. We see that with the announcement of the Emirate, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. They have changed the flag, of course, from the, 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 the Afghan national flag uh, as well. So what we are seeing here is a connection to the roots, to the past of the Taliban. And the, the towering figure of Mullah Omar, who established the organisation and led the organisation in the 1990s, and of course provided safe haven for, um, for Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan, which led to the 9-11 attacks, which we'll see the anniversary of, uh, 20th anniversary of, on the weekend. So all of these figures, the key figures, the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and others in the organisation, very much in the shadow of Mullah Omar and still continuing the legacy of, of what he established with the Taliban. Well, continuing that legacy, Stan, is there any reason that you've got to think that things will be different as we keep hearing from this senior leadership within the Taliban? Well, you have to ask, Dan, different how? If mm. this is the same organisation with the same ideology, they haven't fought for 20 years to abandon that ideology. Now, the question is, what, how will that be implemented? The question is, will it seek a legitimacy? There are challenges inside the country from other organisations, and we've seen that with the, the, the rivalry between uh, the Islamic State of Khorasan and the Taliban as well. But here's another thing to watch, that all of those organisations, the, the patchwork quilt of militant organisations in Afghanistan, across the border in neighbouring Pakistan, share an ideology, share roots, and share members. It was members of the Taliban that defected across to Islamic State that helped to establish the Islamic State of Khorasan. Sirahuddin Haqqani, you mentioned there as well, he's the interior minister. He is the leader of the Haqqani network. The Haqqani network has very close ties to al-Qaeda. The Haqqani network has very close ties to Islamic State Khorasan. It operates around what is an open border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. You mentioned before he is on a watch list, mm. on a wanted list, if you like, as well. So if you have members like Surahuddin Haqqani inside the organisation, if you're an organisation still following in the shadow of its founder Mullah Omar, if you're an organisation that still shares a similar ideology to groups like Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, how do you talk about a Taliban 2.0? It almost suits a very convenient narrative, Dan, that we're hearing from the United States after the pullout of Kabul, the fall of Kabul, that the Taliban is almost a lesser of two evils, um, that the Taliban may be an organisation you could work with. We've heard this from, from the US talking about the Taliban as businesslike and pragmatic. That may suit that particular narrative as the US seeks to recoup some lost credibility after, after fleeing, uh, fleeing Afghanistan. But when you look at the organisation, who makes up the government? the roots and the ideology, very little has changed, if anything. And we certainly are hearing those soundings from the United States and other coalition partners about working with the Taliban, the new interim government, and then whatever government emerges after that. But what sort of challenges is that going to, to throw up for Western countries, given that we've just spent the last 20 years in that country uh, fighting this very group? Well, not just Western countries, of course, as well, mm. because what happens in Afghanistan directly affects the region. You've got neighbouring Afghanistan, you've got Pakistan, you've got neighbouring China, you've got Russia, all of those countries to varying degrees impacted by what's happening there. China has kept its consulate open inside Afghanistan. It has talked about closer ties with the Taliban. It wants to, uh, to establish um, economic links with the Taliban. The Taliban would be looking to the likes of China 
just for those economic links because it needs to be able to, to build its economy if it's going to effectively manage or govern the country. Pakistan is absolutely critical because Pakistan has for many years been a, a supporter of the Afghan Taliban, has funneled money that has come in on the one hand from the United States into the back pocket of Pakistan and then into the hands of the militants themselves. China and Pakistan share a very close relationship. So you can see that what has traditionally been known as the great game uh, dating back centuries, the fight over that particular part of the world is going to involve regional countries. And yes, as you say, what are the implications for the West in pulling out of Afghanistan and saying that it wants to end the forever wars? Joe Biden also now has to deal with the fallout from that. Will Afghanistan again become a haven of militancy? Are we back to where we were before the 9-11 attacks? And what about US credibility after the fall of Kabul? What does it say to its allies? And what does China take away from that in its ongoing, uh, increasing geopolitical, geostrategic rivalry with the United States? What happens in Afghanistan traditionally resonates far and wide, and we're going to see that again. Yeah, and you, you touched on Hakani, who's now the Interior Minister. Well, he's got a $10 million FBI mm. bounty on his head. Surely that's going to throw up an enormous challenge for at least the Biden administration. One thing we know from history, um, Dan, in all of this, is that the United States and other countries are able to walk two sides of the street. We saw during the war with the Soviets in the 1990s how American money went into Pakistan's hands, that then went into al-Qaeda hands or the Taliban hands. We know that big countries can turn a blind eye. We know that out of convenience, countries can, can make for some very uncomfortable or unusual bedfellows. We know that the US has had relationships in parts of the world with despotic leaders or despotic regimes because it is seen to be in the broader interests. The question here is, because Sir Hudun Haqqani is part of this government, does that then taint the Taliban overall? Or are we going to see countries look to try to gain some leverage with the Taliban? Is there an opportunity to be able to bring about some change in Afghanistan by keeping those lines of communication open? What benchmarks are set here in terms of human rights to legitimise the Taliban. All of these questions are yet to be answered and we're still dealing with the humanitarian fallout of this, Dan. There are still people inside Afghanistan who, want, who are trying to get out. We know there are concerns about the rights of women. It goes without mm -hmm. saying here, sadly, that there are no women inside this government, which gives you an indication of just where the Taliban stands on broader questions of women's rights and human rights. So all of that is playing out as we also see the political chess game as to which countries are going to have contact with the Taliban, under what circumstances, and what is the West going to do now in dealing with an organisation that it has fought for the past 20 years? Mm. And on those very situations on the ground, we've been seeing a lot of reporting about the Panchia Valley. Uh, fighting there seems to have ended by the reports that we've been seeing. That area clearly a site of resistance. What do you expect there going forward? Look, uh, ruling Afghanistan, as the Taliban now claims to do, is very different from controlling Afghanistan. It is riven with uh, tribal differences, with various ethnicities, there is a Shia Sunni divide, there are big geographical divides as well inside the country. And the North has traditionally been an area of resistance to the Taliban. Ahmad Shah Massoud, who led a lot of that resistance during the Taliban's rule, is still a very much revered figure amongst many people in Afghanistan. His son has now taken up that fight, leading this resistance in the north in the Panjshir Valley. Now, there have been, as you say, reports of recent days that the Taliban is claiming victory here, that has been able to silence that resistance. But while ever the memory, the legacy of Ahmad Shah Massoud continues, while his son is still leading that fight, then that will continue to be an area of, of resistance uh, and instability for the Taliban. Um, because the Taliban is claiming victory here and returning to power does not mean that the struggle ends. And if there is going to be resistance to the Taliban, it will come from there. It'll be interesting as well to see what support that that resistance gets from the rest of the world 
as well as it continues to try to create a buffer between it and the Taliban controlling the rest of the country. Uh, look, Stan, just finally, we've heard comments today from the former British Prime Minister Tony Blair, who's urged the West not to stop intervening in countries at risk from Islamic extremism. You've reported on every aspect of Mr Blair. I'm sure this won't surprise you. What's your take on it? Yes, it's sort of like a Damascene conversion, isn't it? You know, um, Tony Blair is not in power now, but of course when he was in power, um, he signed up for the war in Iraq, which history will judge and most observers now would agree, proved to be a folly. Um, it distracted from the war in Afghanistan. It upended that region. It ultimately, in the removal of Saddam Hussein, which no one was shedding tears about given the dictatorial hold and brutal hold that he had on that country, also created a power vacuum. Efforts to rebuild that country at nation building saw a fragmented, fractured country, uh, a country that was ripe for the rise of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which ultimately morphed into Islamic State. Then what did we see? We saw the civil war in Syria and Islamic State for a brief period proclaiming a new caliphate. Um, so this question, what does the US do? What does the West do in terms of intervention? It really raises the question, under what circumstances? What does the West stand for? Is the broader liberal democratic project still an organising global principle or not? All of those questions now are being posed after the US withdrawal and the fall of Kabul. Yeah, and important questions they are. ABC International Affairs Analyst Stan Grant, appreciate your insights. Cheers, Dan.